This is the next lesson for the Bible Institute. We're looking at the covenants. We're looking at the dispensations. We just saw Adam and Eve. They fell in the garden. They gave in to the temptation of the serpent. They ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They lost their innocence. Now, man is operating by his conscience. And in this lesson, man is still under the dispensation of conscience. And during this time, God is letting man operate by his conscience as there still is not a written word of God to this point yet. And man is to do what he knows to be right and then bring a bloody animal sacrifice for his sin. Just like you saw Abel do. Abel did the correct work did it the correct way he brought of the firstlings of his flock he brought a bloody animal sacrifice and you remember Cain did it the wrong way God didn't have respect to his offering he brought the fruit of the ground so even all the way back in Genesis 4 blood was required without the shedding of blood is no remission and and those bloody animal sacrifices gave them a temporary forgiveness. A bloody animal sacrifice, it never cleared their sin perfectly. Never uh, did it completely take away their sin. Only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ could take away their sin. So these would give them a temporary covering until the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ could be shed. And we are still under the Adamic covenant so far. Still under the dispensation of conscience as well. And during this time, it doesn't seem that men are eating meat yet. During this time, it hasn't rained yet. But instead, there's a mist coming up from the earth, as it talks about in Genesis 2, 6, that's watering the whole face of the ground. So, And during this time, you have men living to be over 900 years old. So you're looking at a time that's just completely different than the time that we're in today. A lot of strange things, which it wouldn't have been strange back then, but it should be strange now. And this is most likely where you would place the dinosaurs. You know, you hear a lot of talk about dinosaurs at school or the movies everywhere. If dinosaurs ever existed, they most likely existed during this time. Because they say uh, reptiles continue to gr grow as long as they live. So if they lived hundreds of years like people were doing, they'd be quite big. So that could be this time periods where you could put dinosaurs. That'd be another strange thing going on. You, so you could imagine this world that was here during this time it was strange you know 900 year olds you know you'd have a great 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 grandpa still alive you'd have so many places to go on christmas for for christmas day that you would be so so full from all the christmas dinners you couldn't even walk because you got so many grandma houses to go to um you'd have dinosaurs running around you know, it'd be like a fantasy land, only it wouldn't be fantasy, it's it's real. And capital punishment hasn't been introduced yet under this covenant. And man living by his conscience, when his conscience gets seared, he's going to be violent. Lots of killing going on, most likely. Just like in the tribulation, it says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And it's going to be as it were in the days of Noah. So what you have back there uh, in this time period is people being extremely wicked. And since capital punishment hasn't been introduced yet under this, under this dispensation, perhaps that's why the earth is filled with violence, as you'll soon see. Capital punishment is a deterrent to crime. Remember that Cain didn't get killed for killing his brother. 
there wasn't capital punishment yet. And during this time, men are operating mostly by sight. You see, they see the sons of God. They see the cherubims guarding the way of the tree of life. They see some wild things. And we know that Adam and Eve and Cain even talk directly to the Lord. And Adam, living up into his 900s, would have passed down the belief in an almighty God, you know, through his stories. You know, he was a great, 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 great grandfather to people and walking and talking with them. He would have been able to pass down the story of God and what happened in the garden for generation after generation. And there wouldn't have been... I don't see atheism being a problem. They were operating by sight. Wasn't by, like, today it's by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. Then it was more by sight. Can you imagine Adam being alive and him being your papa? You just thought your papa had good stories. There wouldn't be any doubt that God existed. I, I bet you Adam was always talking about when he walked and talked with the Lord in the garden, how he was the first man. Imagine if one of your papas was the first man. Uh, you know, some of his grandkids might ask him, you know, Papa, who was your dad? And he would just say, God. You know, just like it says in Luke chapter 3, Adam was the son of God. You know, this dispensation ends in disaster as well. Because when man lives by his conscience, he just ends up doing what's right in his own eyes. He ends up doing what feels good to him. And it says in Genesis 6, this is where you're going to see the downfall of this dispensation. Genesis 6, 1 and 2. Look at Genesis 6, 1 and 2. It says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. This is yet another satanic attack on the seed. It's a big theme in the Bible, the attack on the seed. Genesis 3.15, if you remember, shows that the Lord told the serpent that the seed of the woman would bruise his head. So from then on, the devil's crosshairs are on that seed. He wants to attack the seed, kill the seed. He killed Abel. He got in Cain, caused him to kill Abel. Cain was of that wicked one. But then the Lord brought Seth along, and the seed continues through Seth. Now, the, Lord, uh, the, the devil has got to these sons of God, most likely, and tempted them to come down and take the daughters of men to corrupt the gene pool so that seed won't ever be born. If he can corrupt the whole gene pool, he can corrupt the seed. If he can get the sons of God, the fallen angels, to intermarry with human women, then he can corrupt the gene pool. And he did it for the most part. He, did, uh, he almost corrupted the entire gene pool. And in Genesis 6, 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. The Lord had Noah preach for a hundred and twenty years, and his street preaching signs probably said, Don't miss the boat. He was prophesying about rain, and it had never rained before. If Noah was in it for the money, he could have started selling umbrellas at his tent meetings and made a fortune. He could have preached rain was coming and then had these new inventions, these umbrellas, and made a fortune. He could have preached rain heavy and heaven sweet and made a killing on umbrellas for nineteen ninety nine dollars apiece. But he wasn't in it for the money. He knew an umbrella... You couldn't save them from this rain. It would have to be a really big boat that was preserved by God himself. And the rain's going to come down so hard that the rain itself was probably doing most of the killing. The rain falling on them was probably killing them before they even drowned. Like, when you, when you have 
that much water coming down at once, you're not going to be even be able to breathe just standing there. But it says in Genesis 6, 4, there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So the sons of God came into the daughters of men, produced giants. They were mighty men, men of renown. They were a very advanced people. And they brought in so much wickedness. The devil had almost successfully corrupted the gene pool. But he doesn't quite all the way. And <clears throat> you can imagine seeing giants walking around this is a strange strange time period in the bible there were giants before and after the flood this most likely means that the fallen angels cohabitated with human women to a lesser extent even after the flood and in genesis 6 5 it shows you what happens during a time of conscience and god saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. See, their conscience was defiled. It was seared with a hot iron. They didn't keep a pure conscience. You know, the Apostle Paul talks about having a good conscience. He talks about keeping it pure. But the more you do whatsoever is right in your own eyes, the more your conscience gets seared, your imaginations and the thoughts of your heart will become more and more evil, evil continually. You desensitize yourself. Genesis 6, 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see that? There is grace in the Old Testament. There is grace in all of the Bible. Without grace, even Noah would have went to hell. Grace is when God gives you something that you don't deserve. He gave Noah the opportunity to build a boat and live. Genesis 6, 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. Notice that Noah was perfect in his generations. Noah and his family had a pure line that could carry that promised seed. The devil tried to corrupt the gene pool. Noah was perfect in his generations. His family hadn't been corrupted by the sons of God. The Lord's plan would now be to have Noah and his family get in the ark... Then the Lord would wipe out the wicked inhabitants of the planet. He would have Noah come out on the other side of the flood and replenish the earth because they were perfect in their generations. And that preserves the seed. The seed would come through one of Noah's sons. And it would be Shem. Genesis 16, And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Everyone in this world comes from Adam and Eve, and everyone in this world comes from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You're reading about your ancestors. Shem represents the Orientals, the Jews. Ham represents the Africans. Japheth represents the, the Europeans, the Caucasians. So, so somebody says, where does the races come from? Uh, well, that's where they come from, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and we don't really know how people got to be different colors and whatnot, but we know it, it has to do with these three boys and how they, they overspread. Shem took a certain place, Ham took a certain spot, Japheth took a certain spot, and then over time, some of them intermarried with each other, and that made even more races. So how they got to be different colors, we don't know. Maybe from 
the sun, I don't know. That's what I heard some people say. The sun being in that area for so long, a certain part, the sun made them a certain color. I, I don't really know. That always confused me. But we know that the different races came from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the whole earth was overspread by them. And Shem carries the seed. So far it was Adam, then Abel, Seth. Um, well, Abel got killed, and then it was Seth, and then Shem. That's who's carrying the promised seed. Genesis 6, 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence, just like it is today. Man proved he couldn't be sinless in a time of innocence. He failed the test. He ate off the tree. Man proved he couldn't live right in the dispensation of conscience. He sears it. And Genesis 6, 12, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Imagine how many men would have been on the planet at this time. You know, 1,700 years into human history. You know, a lot of times passed already. By the time Noah comes around, you've almost got as much time passed as there was between us and the Lord Jesus dying on the cross. That's a lot of human history. With men living to be over 900 years old, there would have been tons of people on the planet. I mean, there's like nine or seven, eight billion today, right? With people just living to be 70, 80, 90, sometimes 100. Imagine if everybody's living to be 900 and more healthy because obviously probably wouldn't be as much diseases back then and things like that. And they were coming from perfect humans like Adam and Eve. Um, perfect bodies almost in a way. It's going to take a long time for the diseases and stuff most likely. And I don't even think it mentions any in Genesis. So people's living a long time. And there's going to be a whole bunch of people if they keep having children, but they're not dying very often. With people living that long, they would have been extremely knowledgeable. With an insane amount of experience and whatever career or field that they had. You know, you imagine whatever job you're doing now. Imagine a scientist living to be 900 years. That's going to be a smart scientist. A doctor living to be 900 years. That's a smart doctor. All the inventors, the musicians. Imagine how good they would have been perfecting their craft over hundreds of years. Imagine how good they would have been at what they did. Most likely, there was a much more advanced civilization before the flood and the Lord wiped out all the evidence of it because he wanted them to start over and get rid of all that junk. Wouldn't it be cool if when we get to be with the Lord one day, he puts us on something like an amusement park ride and lets us explore the days of Noah. I just think that'd be fun to see. Just ride around, see all the crazy stuff, see the giants, the possibly dinosaurs that was here, the 900-year-old people, the all the stuff they would have created and invented and how advanced the civilization would have been. And in Genesis 6, 13, it says, And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Before this takes place, you see Enoch in chapter 5 of Genesis. And he was translated that he should not see death. He was translated before the flood. And the, this pictures believers who will be raptured before the judgment of God falls in the tribulation. Enoch is alive when he's translated. Just like if the rapture happened right now, me and you will be alive when we're translated and not see death. Just as Enoch didn't see death. He's a... He, Enoch is a picture of people who are alive at the rapture of the church. And I imagine Noah was seen as the biggest conspiracy nut that ever existed. He was probably saying, the end is near. Probably had signs saying that. He was probably handing out 
free art tickets for gospel tracks, and they was turning down the free tickets. And in Genesis 6, 14, the Lord tells him, he says, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now the ark, you see, in all these dispensations, under all these covenants, you've got things that picture the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing that's going to picture the Lord Jesus Christ here is the ark itself. The ark was made of something living, right? Trees. Something living had to die to save Noah. He had to kill a bunch of trees. Jesus had to die. He was a living. He's living. He was living, obviously, still living. He had to die to save us. And you know what he's called in Jeremiah 33, 15 and other places? Jesus is called the branch. And he had to die to save us. Some trees had to die to make the ark. And it says, And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. So he will put a door in the side of this ark. That's significant. Because Jesus Christ is the door for us. He said, I am the door. And the ark would have been the way out of the judgment of God, just as Jesus Christ is our way out of the judgment of God. Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The door was in the side of the ark. That's significant. That's how you get in. When Jesus Christ was on the cross, making the way for us to get into the body of Christ, he was pierced where? In his side. Just like there was a door in the side of the ark. The way into the ark was through the side. And when Jesus was preparing a way for us to get in him, he was pierced in his side. The ark was kind of like how God made the creation as well with lower, second, and third stories, just as you have the first heaven, second heaven, and the third heaven. In Genesis six seventeen, it says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. The Lord went from breathing the breath of life into Adam's nostrils to bringing a flood that would destroy all flesh wherein was the breath of life. Genesis 6, 18 says, But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. This is how God set it up. He made them male and female. He wanted Noah to bring the animals into the ark, male and female. Not male on male. Male and male do not go together. That's not convenient as it talks about in Romans 1. Genesis 6, 20 through 22. Of fowls after their kind and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. So, he's getting every angle covered. He's getting him a boat to get in. He's getting animals. Some, some of the animals are there just to reproduce and keep that type of animal alive on the earth. Some are there. See, some of them he takes by sevens because he's going to have to sacrifice some. And you're going to see later that when they get off the ark, they're going to be allowed to eat the animals. So he's going to need some to eat, too. So he's got every angle covered. And it says in Genesis 6, 22, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And this is why the Lord calls him a righteous man.
He does everything that God tells him to do. Now, Genesis 7, 1. And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Now, here's a big difference here. God does not see, in me, see me and you righteous because of what we do. He sees me and you righteous because we got the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ applied to us. Before I had the blood of the Lord Jesus applied to me, before I believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I, did not, I was not seen righteous. Noah did not have the blood of Jesus applied to him. You know why? Because Jesus' blood hadn't been shed yet. He had his own righteousness. 2 Peter 2, 5 calls him a preacher of righteousness. In Ezekiel 14, 14, it says, Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness. Saith the Lord God. Noah's personal righteousness couldn't get him eternal salvation, but it did keep him safe. Uh, your righteousness can't keep you safe or save you. You have to get the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But the thing is, for Noah, the righteousness of Jesus Christ wasn't available yet. Jesus Christ hadn't come down and fulfilled all righteousness yet. He hadn't come down and shed his blood yet. So Noah had his own personal righteousness that kept him safe at least until Jesus Christ would come down down the cross for the sins of the whole world, of everybody in the past, present, and future. And then Noah could go up to the third heaven and be with the Lord. And when, when Noah died, he would have went to the comfort side of the heart of the earth when he died, just as Lazarus did in Luke 16. There he would wait on Jesus Christ until Jesus Christ would come down in the flesh, fulfill all righteousness, shed his blood, give the Old Testament saints access to the third heaven at his resurrection. He would, as it talks about in Ephesians 4, where he would leave, cap, lead captivity captive. When, when Jesus resurrected, he took those Old Testament saints up with him. So Noah, his family, and his animals get in the ark. It says in Genesis 7, 16, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Notice that the Lord shut him in. You couldn't get out, and nothing could get them out. This picture is how once you get in Christ, nothing can separate you from the, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Noah and his family are on that ark, and every living thing outside of that ark dies. Everything's going to die other than the fish. In Genesis 7, 22, and then all in, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. And that makes you think, I don't know if you're like me, but when I read stuff like that, I think, I wonder what was all not on the dry land. Like what was in the water that would have survived this flood that could breathe underwater. I wonder what all was alive back then that was under the water. I don't know if you ever thought about that when you read verses like that, but you get to chapter 8 of Genesis, and the rain finally stops. Noah eventually gets off of the ark, and in Genesis 8.20, he builds an altar and offers a sacrifice to the Lord, which is something we don't do today. Again, you see another difference. We don't sacrifice animals. And, you know, being a dispensationalist is a cuss word to a lot of Christians but really, all being a dispensationalist really is, is that you recognize that there are differences in how man operated throughout the Bible, how God dealt with them throughout the Bible. If you believe they were offering animal sacrifices to the Lord at one point, and God was accepting that at one point, but that we don't offer animals today, and that he's not accepting that today, then you really technically are a dispensationalist, even if you don't call yourself one. We can now begin to look at the next covenant. We were still on the Adamic covenant under the dispensation of conscience. 
And now we're entering to a new dispensation and a new covenant. Now that doesn't mean that everything from the first covenant is done away with. Like, because a lot of the stuff from these covenants overlaps throughout all of the Bible. But we can begin to look at the next covenant. In the Edenic covenant, remember back there in the garden when they were innocent, they were supposed to bypass the tree. In the Adamic covenant, they were supposed to bring a sacrifice. Noah is still supposed to bring a sacrifice, but before he does, he had to board the ark. So you had different ways that different responsibilities, different actions that people were having to take to stay right with God. They had to bypass a tree, bring a sacrifice, board an ark. And, okay, let's look at some details about this covenant. Who's the main characters in this scene? You got Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth. You could say the wives of these four men as well. That's all that's left is these eight people. And unless one of one of their uh, wives was with child, that would be another nine months before there was another person that even showed up. And this is the the covenant is called the Noahic covenant, what people call the Noahic covenant. And here are some things that you're going to see under this covenant. God establishes the seasons. He said there would never cease to be summer. Winter, fall, you know, in Genesis 8.22. So there'd always be seasons. And, you know, during this time, you know, the weather was obviously going to be different. It would start raining consistently now. And during this time, Noah is told to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That's another part of this covenant, just like was under Adam's covenant as well. We see that in Genesis 9.1. And the next thing, animals will now fear man. That's Genesis 9-2. Man can now eat animals. Genesis 9-3. This part of the covenant goes all the way up until the millennial reign. The next thing, capital punishment is instituted. This goes all the way through to the time when death has ended. See, before, Cain didn't get killed for killing Abel because there was no capital punishment yet so what's the purpose of this covenant to replenish the earth after the flood and maintain order in the world so this will also bring in another dispensation as i'll show you in a second what's the token a token or symbol or sign of this covenant it's the rainbow genesis 9 12 through 17 when people will see that rainbow should remind them the Lord's not going to flood the earth again. Okay, what was the test? Well, the first test was, Noah, are you going to build the ark? He did. Are you going to board the ark? Willingly, he did. And after they get off, the test is, are you going to multiply and scatter? They don't. They do multiply, but they don't scatter. They failed the test. So God, as you'll see if it, in a minute, God scatters them in Genesis 11. How is Christ seen? Christ is seen as the ark. Okay, now let's look at the dispensation that we're going to go into. Who's the steward of it? Noah. What's the dispensation called? Human government. Why? Because people were to govern themselves. And before God put in his governmental law, every man did that which was right in his own eyes, which they do anyway but they really did it before then and this resulted in violence and corruption the earth was corrupt before god the earth was filled with violence and the thoughts of the imaginations of their heart was only evil continu continually their conscience was seared now god's gonna do another th new thing where he's bringing in his governmental law and he's gonna show them that even at that man is still corrupt Okay, what's their responsibility? Men were to govern and police themselves. They were also supposed to spread out and multiply over all the earth. What's the failure? Men began to 
to do things without God. They began to work and do things without God. They united in an attempt to make a name for themselves in Genesis 11. They did not scatter. They united. They all got together. What's the result? They make a bad name for themselves, especially Nimrod. What do you call somebody that you think's crazy or silly? Nimrod. Boy, he really made a name for himself. What's the judgment? The Lord came down and confounded the language and scattered the people. That's Genesis 11, 8. What's the length of time of this dispensation? And the account of it? Well, Genesis 8, 20 to 11, 9 thereabouts. Around 430 years. It extends from Noah to, to Abraham. This doesn't mean that everything in the Noahic covenant came to an end. But Babel is the end of what people call the dispensation of human government. Now notice, this dispensation of human government begins with a righteous man building an altar. Genesis 8.20 And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The next verse shows us that the Lord accepts this offering, and the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more every living thing as I have done. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. See, there's those seasons I was telling you about. He establishes these seasons. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, Day and night shall not cease. Of course, any sacrificing of animals in the Old Testament points to the perfect sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus. And this dispensation began with a righteous man building an altar to offer sacrifices to God. It begins with a new start and a planet cleared of the sinful things that, brought in, that were brought in by the sons of God. This dispensation will end with man trying to go above God and get back in contact with those same sons of God. Genesis 9-1, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, just like he told Adam to do. Adam had the opportunity, before he fell, to repopulate the planet with perfect sons of God to replace the sons of God who fell. Noah has a fresh start. As the head of his house, he's basically the king of the entire world. Just as Adam, he was king of the entire world. He had dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, over everything. Imagine owning everything. He could choose anywhere he wanted. His boys were supposed to spread out, overspread the earth. But something happens. People end up getting together. It says in Genesis 9, 2, And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea and to your hand are they delivered. Just as Adam had dominion over the animals, so does Noah. Genesis 9, 3, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Something changes here. Man can now eat the animals. And he can eat any of the animals, unlike under the law when there were clean and unclean animals. Today for us, we can also eat anything as long as we can receive it with thanksgiving, as it talks about in 1 Timothy 3. It says in Genesis 9, 4, But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. You, could, you just couldn't eat the blood. You can eat, he could have ate any of the animals, but he couldn't eat blood. And it says, And surely your blood of your lives will I require, at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So you see that? Capital punishment now, as we talked about, is introduced under this covenant. God had to bring in governmental law because under, under the dispensation of conscience, man was becoming more and more wicked. There needed to be deterrence to crime. Man was lawless and disobedient. Now, we go into the dispensation of human government. Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For the image of God made he man. This is capital punishment for murder, 
You didn't have this under the Adamic covenant, and that's why Abel or Cain wasn't killed for killing Abel. Genesis 9, 7, And you be ye fruitful and multiply, and bring forth abundantly in the earth, and multiply therein. Noah's sons would have to repopulate the planet. It was a fresh start. And they all come from Noah's three sons. All the people that you see running around this planet came from three men, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. That's that Noahic covenant I was telling you about. It's better to look at the Bible through the covenants rather than the dispensations. Genesis 9, 2 and 11, And with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl and of the cattle, of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood, neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth, no more worldwide floods. The next time it's going to be by fire. And God said, This is the token of, of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. There is that token I told you about. This token or sign or symbol of this covenant is the rainbow. And he said, I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and all the earth. Notice that's Genesis 9, 13. 13 is the number of rebellion. And what do men that are rebels do? They take this token of the covenant, this rainbow, and make it into something perverted. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, which was between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Remember the next time you see a rainbow, that this has to do with the promise given in the Noahic covenant. And the bow shall be seen, the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, and I, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Well, years go by, and they repopulate, they're fruitful and multiply, as they're supposed to do, and it doesn't take long for man to get wicked again. And one of Noah's great grandsons or great great grandsons uh, becomes a real instrument for the devil his name is nimrod and nimrod helps bring in the complete failure he helps bring it in he's not the only one responsible obviously but he helps bring in the, the complete failure of the dispensation of human government it says in genesis 10:10 10, 10, that the beginning of his kingdom was babel so nimrod is king of babel and when you, what you find through the rest of the Bible is Babylon is associated with the devil and his people. That sets up the pattern for it. And Nimrod is a picture of the Antichrist. And Babel is a picture of, of the ecumenical stuff, the one world government stuff, a movement of bringing everything and everyone together in a one world religion and one world government. Unity like this is never a good thing, especially because they are leaving the person out who matters most. Everybody's included except one person. You know who it is? God. And it says in Genesis 11, 1, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. You see, they're all one. They are all together. Everyone accepting everything about everybody except God. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, and they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar, you know, man-made stuff. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Who does that remind you of? Lucifer, who was trying to exalt himself above the stars of God. Notice this phrase, And let us make us a name lest we be scattered or brought upon the face of the whole earth. Well, that's what the Lord wanted them to do was scatter. Notice they said, let us make us a name. There's where you mess up. Instead of trying to exalt the name of God over everything, they were trying to exalt themselves over everything. Instead of trying to exalt the name above every name, they were trying to exalt Nimrod and themselves. Most likely, the tower was to try and get back in contact with the fallen sons of God. They were looking for higher knowledge, just like Eve was. 
And in Genesis 11, 5, it says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. This is also what will happen at the end of the tribulation. At the end of that one world government brought in by the Antichrist, at the end of the tribulation, what happens? The Lord comes down. And Genesis eleven six, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. They got so smart. They got so full of knowledge that they become full of themselves. They got all high and mighty, as they say. And it says, the Lord says, Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Here's where the different languages come into play. They were supposed to spread out. They didn't spread out. So the Lord is going to come down and spread them out himself. So this dispensation ends with them failing the test. They didn't spread out. And the judgment, God spreads them out. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So this is the judgment that concludes the dispensation of human government. It is the result of their failure to pass the test, which was to do, which had to do with being fruitful, multiplying, replenishing the earth. They did that part, but they didn't spread out. So God spreads them out. And it says in Genesis 11, 9, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and then from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So they did make a name for themselves. What do you call somebody you think stupid? Nimrod. What do you call somebody who is saying a bunch of foolishness? You say, why are you babbling? They did make a name for themselves. God has a sense of humor. He, he, he let them make a name for themselves, even if it wasn't a good name. But that concludes this part of, of the lesson. Um, next time we're going to get into Abraham. Today you've seen the Noahic Covenant and the dispensation of human government.